In this third Evo Devo video, we'll be looking at allometric studies done in the 1900s. So this second approach to understanding the relationship between development and evolution studies something called allometry, and this really took off in the 1900s. So as organisms grow, and they develop, right, different parts of them grow at different rates, and that tends to lead to different shapes of organisms. And so the idea here is that maybe small changes in relative growth rates, because of some sort of genetic change, maybe those small changes in relative growth rates can cause big differences in the final form, the phenotype. And one way to study this would be to plot the sizes of traits over time, so the age of the organism, not geologic time. Right, so we're looking at the age of a particular organism, looking at its development. And this resulting curve is an ontogenetic trajectory. So it's a trajectory of development. So for example, we have, let's measure height on this axis and length on this axis. We have a juvenile organism here. As time goes on, it gets longer and taller. It gets longer and taller. And we can diagram this out and we can think about how maybe the shape of an organism will change. In this case, I've drawn it to be isomorphic. The shape of this guy is the same shape as this guy because I have the exact same rate of change of height and length. But maybe there could be genetic changes that cause these rates during development to differ and then you would actually get a different shaped final organism that would be very different from what it started off as. And if you have different shapes of development here, that could arise from genetic changes. So for example, um, let's look at ontogenetic trajectory. Here's a linear relationship where both the, the body and the head are getting bigger at like the same rate. On the other hand here, I've drawn it where the body gets bigger first or more quickly, and only then later does the, the head kind of catch up. And if you think about this as development, this organism here now looks different from this one and this one. And so if you had a genetic change that caused development to happen like this, so maybe you're still getting the same final adult form, but now maybe another genetic change could like prolong this, and if you ended up here, you would end up with a smaller head on a large body. So different developmental rates or durations would result in different final shapes. For example, actually if development stopped here, you would end up with a smaller and different shaped individual than if it continued. And this different shape is only possible with a different ontogenetic trajectory for this organism compared to this organism. So here's a more systematic approach to this. We're going to look at four different types of developmental change. I'm plotting, say, the log of the, the size of the head, the log of the size of the body. They're all starting off as this kind of same shaped juvenile. And the normal kind of baseline ontogenetic trajectory will be along here to get to an organism here with like equal sized head and body um, in our hypothetical organism. So we can envision a type of change called hypermorphosis. Hypermorphosis is just to continue the ontogenetic trajectory further. So at the beginning, the body was a little bit bigger than the head. And so the head is growing a little faster than the body to get to equal size here. If you continue those relative rates of growth, you would get an individual here with a bigger head than its body. So the shape of this individual would be different from the shape that it maybe started off at. That's called hypermorphosis. And it tends to lead to a structure called paramorphosis, which is kind of like an exaggerated form of the adult. Paramorphosis can also come around from acceleration. So for example here, if instead of developing the same rate in terms of head size versus body size, if the head developed a little bit more quickly than the body, it was accelerated, then you could actually end up at this point by the time the body got to the size of the baseline, now the head would be larger. You have the same sort of paramorphosis final form where the head is bigger than the body, but it's kind of achieved through a different mechanism. It's achieved through acceleration of one of the traits development instead of the extension of the development of both traits. Two other types of developmental change can occur. In progenesis, development proceeds and then is halted early. So this is like the opposite of hypermorphosis. And because the head is not as big as the body in this example, this individual looks like a juvenile. All right, so it has a different body shape than the baseline that we start from. And this individual looks like a juvenile, and we call that pedomorphosis or pedomorphic 
individuals or species, they look like juveniles, even though they're an adult, if the development is stopped here. And that same sort of juvenile looking final form can also be achieved by neoteny. In neoteny, the development of body proceeds the same as in the baseline, but say development of the head is slower or truncated, now you would get an individual here where the body is the same size as the baseline, but the head is smaller if development of that region was slower. And so this neoteny, this slowing down of the development of one of the traits, right, the opposite of acceleration, leads to pedomorphosis. So four different changes to development can result in two broad categories of changes in the final form of the adult. And we can see a number of examples of this. So many salamanders have gills when they're juveniles, and then as they mature, they lose their gills. So here's ambistema. As a juvenile, it's got these external gills, and then as an adult, it's lost those external gills. But some species of salamanders actually have gills as adults. Via neoteny, the process, they end up achieving a patamorphic final state. This is nectaris, and you can see as an adult, it actually still has these gills that it had as a juvenile, and then it stopped development, essentially, of that part of its body and retained the juvenile trait into adulthood. Another example where we can see allometric effects are come from Irish elk and their antlers. So this is a, a skeleton in a museum. You can see how big these antlers are. This is a figure showing that the antlers on these elk are gigantic, right? This is 3.6 meters. That's like that 12 feet or something like that across in these antlers, this is gigantic. This is huge, right? These antlers are almost as big as the entire body of these elk. So when people looked at these things, they wondered, like, what sort of craziness is happening to cause Irish elk to have some gigantic antlers way bigger than everything else? But it turns out that they're actually just proportional to the size of the body along a curve. If you look at other species of deer on a plot like this, it's kind of like this where the height of the shoulder and the size of the antlers has a curvilinear relationship like this. And so Irish elk are actually really tall, big deer, just extending out the process of development in order to get a larger body size. This hypermorphosis that likely happened in order to give the bigger body size resulted in achieving antlers that were even bigger because following this trajectory out, you get antlers that are even bigger relative to the size of the body than seen in earlier stages of development or other species that have not undergone hypermorphosis. So we have the evolution of this really unusual looking trait arising just from a simple change in development, this hypermorphosis. And so in fact, Irish elk are not outliers or unusual. They're just on the same trajectory as all the other deer that are their relatives. There, so there are a number of studies looking at things like this, like here's the size of the body, here's the size of the brain. Let's plot them against each other, usually the log, because that straightens things out. And then identifying things like, oh, here are humans with very large brains for the size of our body in a group of primates. And groups can achieve their different traits either by truncating brain or having smaller brains. You would end up down here. Continuing hypomorphosis is maybe one way to get these things here. There are a lot of allometric studies plotting traits against traits in the adults. And then these changes here can just arise from these four different processes we saw earlier. A more sophisticated prediction of relative growth rates can be done by using kind of a grid and actually thinking about not just maybe broad categories like body size and head size, and maybe think about x, y directions within this grid. So this is what Darcy Thompson came up with. And this approach can actually help us understand the mola mola. So the mola mola is also called the ocean sunfish. This is one of the strangest fish in the world. They're gigantic. They don't really have like a, a separate tail, it looks like, and they have a big fin on top and a big fin on the bottom. They're just a really weird looking fish, and there's really nothing else that looks like them. So how did they arise? Well, it turns out that pufferfish and the mola mola are in the same order. They're fairly closely related, and when you look at their skeletons, you can actually see some of the similarity. Here's a mola mola skeleton. Here's a pufferfish skeleton, and you can see there's this kind of line of bone right there and there that's a little bit similar to this. And we have these um, connections of bone there, which is similar to this. The shape seems pretty different, and this is a very different fish, and it's much bigger than a pufferfish. 
But we can actually do even better than this. We can put them on a grid. And we put them on a grid. Here's a puffer fish. Let's outline them and put them on a grid that's squared. And then we can actually get the shape of an ocean sunfish just by kind of stretching this grid out. You can kind of create the same shape here. And so to go from this to this, maybe all that needs to happen is there's more development in the vertical direction the further back you go in the fish, right? So the more posterior in the fish, the more development in the vertical directions, and you can actually deform this fish into this fish. So maybe going from here to here is just a matter of changing a few little things during development, the timing or the rates of growth. So these developmental mutations that can change rates of growth in different regions can kind of easily explain the evolution of one sort of fish into another sort of fish, even creating a body form that looks completely different. It is, in fact, not that different when you look at allometry. So if we look at humans, if we reverse this previous head to body size ratio thinking, in humans, the head starts off very large compared to the size of the body, right? The head is like basically the size of the body pre-birth, right? And during development until birth, Basically, the head's not changing much, but the body is, or the, the body is changing more than the head, right? These are the relative proportions at birth of a human. And then we actually see the body grows more quickly than the head does. And so our adult form is very different from our baby form, which is also very different from our fetus form. You can see the same sort of diagram here. You can see the same sort of diagram here. So the relative proportions of the head and body in humans change quite a lot over our ontogenetic trajectory. So one of the proposals is that selection for increased intelligence in humans via larger brain size in adults could act via neoteny leading to pedomorphosis, right? So if we go back to the previous slide, one way to evolve a final organism that has a bigger head would be to create a neoteny Right, to get a pedomorphic organism, an organism a bit more like this than, say, our ancestors would have been as an adult. So maybe selection for larger brains via neoteny leading to pedomorphosis. Adults and humans may look like younger versions or juveniles in our ancestral species. So do human heads look like juvenile chim chimpanzee human ancestors? So we could use Thompson's grid approach. Before we go look at that, if you think about it, adults right, have a very characteristic way of looking, and then juveniles, they have bigger eyes. In this movie, he kind of does both. You can see that there are visual differences between juveniles and adults. Maybe selection to become pedomorphic will change the way that the adults look and maybe make them look more or less like juveniles. So let's take this Thompson's grid approach. So here is a very young chimpanzee and a very young human, and if you kind of put their skulls into one of these grids, and then change the sizes of these grids to get to the final kind of adult profile, you deform the squares in the grid in the following manner to get to this adult form. To get to this adult form for chimpanzees, you have to deform them in the following manner, but along the way to this skull shape, you kind of pass through a skull shape that's a lot more like modern adult humans. So if we think about our ancestor maybe having development that takes this trajectory, all right, assuming that modern chimps exhibit the sort of development that our ancestors did, one way to get an adult skull that looks like this is to stop development, essentially, at this shape and then just grow larger from there. So it could, in fact, be that Selection for larger brains, because the body size to brain size ratio is smaller, right? Brains are much larger in juveniles than in adults. Selection for larger brains may, as a side effect, have resulted in the maintenance of the juvenile looking face. So perhaps we actually have our characteristic profile and look because we've essentially were selected to be like juvenile versions of whatever our ancestors are. As an interesting aside, this maybe accounts for our, some of our hairlessness as well, right? Juveniles tend to have less hair than adults. 
So human faces may have arisen via neoteny from our ancestral primate, right? When you look at baby chimps, they seem like a lot cuter and more pleasing to us than say like adult chimps, which seem less like babies. So again, we don't have a big sample size of so is this a cause or a correlation? Did we have selection for the faces we have maybe because of sexual selection? Or is it just a side effect of selection for larger brains? Or maybe there are other things that are being selected for as well, like maybe lighter, thinner skeletons or something. But we can examine all those questions by using allometric techniques.